Good morning, church family. Welcome to the Sunday School Hour. And this morning, as we continue our theme for the month about scriptural growth, we're going to talk about why I'm still King James only. Now, I've studied this issue for many years, and after seeing the opposition's arguments for changing Bibles to the newer versions, and the argument about the Greek and the Hebrew and the different variations, I'm still King James only. It's almost come to a point where people have an attitude of disdain or dislike if you tell them that I believe God has preserved His Word and there's one Bible that's correct and no others. Now, I understand that there are certain things that are not changed in all the new Bible versions, but you understand there are 400 Bible versions that have been printed that are different than the King James since the 1900s. 400. I have a whole list of them. One time I read many of them. Uh, I'm not going to do that this morning. I want to be as brief and uh, uh, simple in this this morning. Uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and Lord, we love your word. And Lord, we are to be a people of the book, and I'm thankful that you have given us your words. Lord, we have the answers from you. Uh, Lord, it's reassuring. It gives us confidence to know that we can search it out and understand it for ourselves, that some other man or church or organization cannot keep us from getting close to you. Lord, I just wish that you would challenge us to get in the Word and get close to you. Lord, my prayer for this morning is that you would help us to understand your promises and the power in your Word. But Lord, help us to get close to you. Give us a desire for your words. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of our uh, church doctrinal statements is, we believe that the King James Bible is the perfect Word of God. It's perfect and without error. There are other Bibles that have contradictions and in omissions and things that have changed. Uh, we believe that it is inspired and preserved. And we're going to talk about that this morning in Sunday School. Inspired and preserved. We believe that all other English translations of the Bible are corrupt and are perversions of God's Word. They've changed things, they've perverted things, they've deleted things intentionally. If you would, in your Bible, go to Psalm 12 for me. Go to Psalm 12. I'm going to read 2 Timothy 3.15. 2 Timothy 3.15, the Bible says, "...and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus." It's the Bible that teaches our children that we can trust in Jesus for salvation. The next verse reads, "...all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That is the source of truth. It is inspired. That means God breathed. God opened His mouth and His Spirit breathed these words to us. All Scripture is profitable, it says. Uh, in the next verse, 2 Timothy 3, 17, it says, "...that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works." God wants us to grow up and be complete, and it's through His Word we're able to do more for Him, do good works for Him, because Hey, uh, uh, we love Him because He first loved us. And He says, if you love Me, keep My commandments. So God's will is that we would shine forth in this dark time and be a bright light and share the true light, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And He is the Word of God. This is very powerful. If we believe in the inspiration of Scripture, we must believe in the preservation of Scripture. If God gave us His words, well, God is obviously big enough, powerful enough, and strong enough to preserve his words. It's interesting that that old-fashioned King James Bible that the world seems to hate today, you can't change it. From 1611 up until today, all those that are commonly called the King James Bible, although there are a few variations here and there where one publisher left out a word or miscapitalized or mispunctuated, it's the same word, tried and true. It's often referred to as the textus receptus, which means the received text. It is the majority text. There are 5,200 copies of parts of the Bible that have strung together. The history is on our side that this is the one 
one that has not been changed by the Roman Catholic Church. The critical text, as it's often called, because it criticizes what we know to be true, has less than 45 copies on their side. And even in that, they're not complete copies. There's commonly four main uh, co compilations of the Bible that they stand on. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. In 2 Peter 1, it says, We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well to take heed, as a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God's word is when the Spirit came down on a man and spake to a man and preserved it through the power of His Holy Spirit. Those that heard it, that had the Holy Spirit as well, they took part in preserving it and writing it down, copying it, repeating it, and teaching it to their children. Now you're in Psalm chapter 12. Let's take a look at this. Psalm chapter 12, if you would look at verse number 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. You know, there's no uh, inappropriate words in the Bible, not one. It says in the next verse, or in the continuing that verse, it says, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. God's Word is like silver. Boy, the characteristics of silver are really amazing. They're, they are, it's good for health, and it's good for all sorts of things. And uh, look at the next verse, verse 7, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Does it say, I have to keep them? No, no, it says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. He's going to keep them Himself. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So His words are inspired. That means God breathed through the Holy Spirit. His words have been preserved. They're timeless. You cannot delete it. Even if they outlawed it internationally, as they've done in certain countries. And, and, and they send the military to your house to get your copy. Well, you know what? You still have it in your heart. You have it written on the walls. You have it in the minds. You have it all over the place. They would not be able to extinguish the fire that is God's Word. Now, in the NIV, this is a parallel Bible, and it's, this, this Bible's tested NIV positive, okay? So be very careful when you read it. I want to read that same verse to you. Look at verse number 6. It says, And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. Here's what's interesting. There is not one copy of the Hebrew anywhere that uses the word gold. Not one. The NIV translators took it upon themselves to just make it up out of thin air and add it to God's Word, which is a very dangerous thing to do. You guys know about the telephone game, right? Or maybe you have a, uh, an older brother, sister, telling a younger brother, sister, where mom said to do this and to give me one of your cookies. You know, like, whoa, careful now. Don't come in the authority of your parent saying something that they didn't say. You'll get in big trouble for that. Well, it's the same way with God's Word. Now, listen, you look at verse 7. In verse 7, in the King James, I'll read it one more time. It says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. He says, I will preserve my word. It's up to him. He made a promise. He's going to do it. In the NIV, it says, You, Lord, will keep the needy safe and will protect us forever from the wicked. Notice how they change the subject here. It goes from God saying, I'm going to preserve my word. They say, I'm going to keep needy people safe. They've totally changed what God is teaching about the preservation of Scriptures. This is His promise. Go to Revelation chapter 22. Go to Revelation chapter 22. We, there are two lineages, if you will. There's two histories. There's two families. Uh, there is the original Bible, the original manuscripts. Um, and it came primarily out of a city called Antioch. Who knows what Antioch was known for in the Bible? They were first called Christians in Antioch. We see that in the book of Acts. So we have the Christian lineage. And then later we have uh, what's, what the Alexandrian texts. The city Alexandria, uh, we had some very nefarious characters that worked there. And they taught what's commonly called Gnosticism, the big capital G. If you've ever seen the Freemasonry symbol, that G in there means 
Gnostic or Gnosis. It's the word for knowledge. And they worship knowledge more than the creator of the knowledge. Right? Uh, so it's almost like a history of fundamentalism versus Freemasonry. It's like uh, Rome versus the resistance. What has happened is there are uh, two lineages of Bibles. What we call the King James Bible today was originally called the Holy Bible. And prior to that, there was a history that brought it all together. Well, the Catholics have rebranded today and they call it the Reformation or the Reformers. That's really just Catholicism. It is Gnosticism. Now the Gnostics spiritualize things they shouldn't and it omitted a lot of scriptures. That's a sermon in, of, uh, in and of itself. But they were the ones that created the critical text and rejected the majority text. The critical text is really a minority. If I had 5,200 copies here and 45 down here, and I say, well, these 45 are slightly different, that makes it better than these. You would probably say, hold on a minute, why are you trying to pull a fast one? Bigger than that, there's many problems with that minority text. I'll get into that in just a second. You say, well, what's wrong with one using one of these other Bibles, like even the New King James or you know, the ESV, or now uh, John MacArthur has written his own copy of the Bible called the Legacy Standard Bible. Uh, what's wrong with using one of those? It's in a language we can better understand. The King James reads at a 6th or 7th grade English, uh, which most of us don't, but the Bible does. And there's a few words that would do us well to learn. You're in Revelation 22. I want you to see this in verse number 18. Revelation 22, verse number 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written into the book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. The promise is if you intentionally change the word of God to deceive people, God says there's no hope for you. You have a promise of hellfire. Now listen, Jesus died for everyone's sins. This is somebody the Bible would call a reprobate or a reject or a son of the devil, somebody that's possessed, that hates God, hates his word, and they want to manipulate it. This is not somebody that accidentally writes it down incorrectly or misquotes it. No, no. This is somebody with evil intention. Uh, but there's a curse on anybody that would change the Bible. Now go to Psalm 119. You say, well, what's wrong with all the other versions? Why can't I use one? Well, there's some things missing. Like the word Calvary. Did you know the word Calvary is missing from all the other Bibles? Did you know that hell, the word hell, is omitted, deleted, or modified, changed into Sheol or Hades in the majority of all the other Bibles? Did you know that the word Lucifer is missing from all of the other Bibles? Did you know that the word New Testament has been deleted also from these Bibles. How about this? Here's a good word. Regeneration. Regeneration. It's talking about the deadness of our spirit, being born again, deleted, omitted, totally removed. Here's one that gets me, though. It's the complete signature of God. It's the phrase, the Lord Jesus Christ. That Name with title is under attack by all the other Bibles. He is our Lord. He is God. His name was Jesus. He was a man. He was the Son of Man. He was the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Anointed One. Well, they like to attack it and pull away Christ or pull away Lord in, in a lot of the places that it's mentioned in most of the other Bibles. And you say, well, how did we get our Bible anyway? I mean, God did promise us that it would be perfect and pure and preserved over time. It came from the mouth of God. Now listen, if we have 400 copies of the Bible today that disagree with the King James Bible, and you know, it's not even about the man King James, never was, but if we ha there's a difference. We have to uh, delineate it somehow. It's not just, you say Holy Bible, there's no telling what you'll get, right? So I, I specify, it's called the King James Bible. I am King James James only for that reason because it's the one that's not missing things. And listen, things that are different cannot be the same. Amen. If I said, who drives a truck? Raise your hand. Brother Jake, what kind of truck do you drive? Chevy Silverado. All right, Brother Clint, what kind of truck do you drive? Common diesel. 
Chevy Cummings diesel. Brother Paul, what kind of truck do you drive? Tundra. Tundra. That's a Toyo. All right. What do you drive? Avalanche. Avalanche. That's a Chevy. Ford. Ford. We got one over here. All right. Amen. All right. I'm just kidding. That's my personal preference. You've got a Ford too. All right. Who else has a truck? Uh, Brother Ross is like, yeah, I've got a Chevy too. You know. Oh, you got a Ford also. He's he's. He's got the, the work truck is a Ford. Okay, all right, I'm just picking on everybody because I like Ford, although I used to be a Chevy guy. But anyway, uh, so what does it matter? Well, there is a difference. Not every truck is the same, is that right? Now, some jobs, hey, I need a truck. Okay, a truck will do. Others, it's like, no, no, no. We got to haul some big equipment. I need an F-450. Don't bring your, your little S-10, okay? It just won't do. It'll blow up the motor, right? Uh, Miss Sally drives a truck, too. She's got a 98 Dodge Ram. Is that right? That's back when they called him a Dodge. And it, yeah. All right. I want you to understand it's the same way with Bibles. Things that are different are not the same. If I said, I need a Bible, any Bible will do. Well, I'm not, I'm not really setting the expectations very high. If I said, I want to show you the verse that teaches you you need to study to show yourself approved unto God, I need a King James Bible because all the other Bibles delete that phrase and change the word study because the Catholics don't want you to study it for yourself. They want you to do works to be approved of another man. So they want to manipulate and delete that and change it and so you won't find that word study in any other Bible. So sometimes you need a specific thing to do the job. Well, I want it to be accurate. Well, I want to study the Bible for myself. I want a King James Bible. It's very, very important. The devil has been trying to attack God's Word from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. He said, Yea, hath God said? Uh, Eve said, Well, wait, God said, God said something to Adam, and Eve got it, and Eve said to Satan, Whoa, whoa, God said this. And he says, Well, is that really what God said? And that's what the devil wants to do to you. He wants to cause you to doubt God's word and his commandments. Why? So he can get you to sin. So he can get you to disobey. This is the intent behind it all. Uh, originally, there were the Ten Commandments. God brought his hand down and wrote it with his own hand. And we still have that copy today on display. Is that right? Do we have those original Ten Commandments? Why not, Brother Doug? Physical processes. Now, it was written on a rock, which is well preserved. But what happened? Moses brought down the tables of the commandments, and what did he do? He threw them and broke them. We don't have the originals. Oh, man. So there are no Ten Commandments. We don't need the originals, they're God preserved inspired, handwritten by God, and God did it a second time. He recreated them, the Ten Commandments, and gave them back to him. And they were taught and taught and taught and taught and taught and taught and taught. And we have it today. And your Bible has the Ten Commandments, unless it's a Catholic Bible. They only have nine commandments. They changed that. Okay. Uh, but we don't need the originals because God has preserved His Word. He inspired it. He has preserved it. So the Ten Commandments have disappeared. That law, or it's often called the Torah, um, uh, is mo in Moses, right? So we go into Moses, and Moses has the commandments. This is very important. I tell you, in Ephesians 6 it says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So get saved and then get the Bible. Listen, this is the sword of the Spirit. It's the Word of God. It's how we do spiritual warfare. The NIV is like a butter knife. It's like a wet noodle. You might be able to do something with it, but not quite what you can do with a very large sword, okay? So we're doing spiritual warfare. We need the right weapon. Moses is often referred to as the first five books. It's also called the law. Uh, nerds will call it the Pentateuch. or uh, and, and listen, what's interesting, it tells us that every king had to make his own copy. He had to handwrite it. He had to look at it and write it and write his own copy so he could read his own copy. Saul and David and Solomon, these kings would have followed this commandment and obeyed that. Uh, it, what is the foundation? Well, that was it, the first five books. It says in Mark 10, and he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? Jesus said, What did Moses command you? Well, they knew the first five books. But then, of course, God's word began to expound and expand. Uh, we have in the Old Testament 39 books in the Old Testament. Um, I find it interesting that 40 is a more perfect number. 
It's almost like God was forecasting something. He's like, I'm going to give you 39, and it's like we're waiting on that 40th, because that's perfect, and God does perfect things with perfect numbers uniquely. And it's almost like something else was coming, and if you took the New Testament, that's your perfect 40. But of course, it's made up of 27 books, giving us a total of 66 books, which, what day was man created? Sixth. The number of man is six. And it's, he kind of gives us six, six. Hey, I'm giving you 66 books. It's try to perfect you and bind you and show you your need for God's law. And of course, with the law comes the promise and the blessings. Matthew 11, he says, for all the prophets and the law prophesied unto John. So you had the law and the prophets. In the Old Testament, you had the law and the historical books with the kings. And then you had uh, the wisdom books and and the prophets, and you had all these books coming together, and then we get the New Testament beginning with John. And Jesus said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everything in the Old Testament comes down to one word, and what's that word? Love. Thou shalt love God and love your neighbor, right? All that comes down to these two commandments, which is one, and it's love. So the whole Bible is summarized, especially the Old Testament, in love. What's interesting in John chapter 1, it says, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. This is what was said to Nathanael. We found the Messiah. It's Jesus. He is the one that Moses wrote about, the prophets wrote about. He is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Of course, Nathanael was a skeptic, and Jesus started talking to him, and it didn't take long, and he says, whoa! He says, you're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. And he began to proclaim the deity of Jesus. Now, today we have the New Testament. It came from Greek which you don't have to speak Greek to understand it. Greek was the trade language or the world language in so many ways at that time, just as English has become today. Now, through the priesthood of the believer, you had the Old Testament priests. They copied every line. There was a mathematical checksum to make sure there were no errors. If anything was wrong, they eliminate it and start over, right? Well, we're the New Testament priesthood of believers, and you had such New Testament priests as Peter, and Paul, and Titus, and uh, uh, James, and John, and some of these guys that were saved, and they were a New Testament priest, in a sense, if you were, and they've preserved the word. Now, we had it in Greek. There's a big problem with Greek. I think it's important to point this out. The most popular common uh, Greek editions out there, the, the Nestle Alan 27th edition, it's often called the UBS Greek was backwritten to match the Catholic Bibles. And if you go to a Bible college today, many of these liberal Bible colleges will say, well, if you get this Greek, it'll correct this. And I'm here to tell you that this English version is better than that version of the Greek. It's a Greek that was, it's not the original, it was written to match the critical text that's full of errors to eliminate verses. That's an important detail. So I don't encourage you to go try to learn Greek to get closer to God. No, just work on English. We all have a few more words we need to learn and be more diligent in reading your English Bible and pray to the Lord. He'll help you. Uh, the original autographs are essentially gone. There were copies of the originals. There are many Bibles throughout history that brought us for the Waldensians, the Peshitta, Texas Receptus, as we know it, the Wycliffe Bible. And then the King James 1611. Many editions six, since the 1611. Uh, the Apocrypha was there as a historical book that's been dropped because it has uh, uh, scriptural contradictions. It was never meant to be scriptural. Uh, the King James uh, 1611, I've seen people that tape 1611 on their Bible. I got a 1611. I'm like, let me see that. Huh, why does it say 1769? Okay, well, because the English language has changed and the font has changed, and the punctuation has changed, and the, the, the King James Bible and Wycliffe essentially created the English language as we know it. It solidified it. And so it's not really a 1611, although that's when really a flag was put in the sand, and there's been many updates to our language, generally speaking, and especially the font, because if you've ever held one, you know it's a little bit difficult to read. So there have been no major... Um, modifications in any King James from 1611 to today, unless you get a rebranded like a KJV 
ER is one they'll call it easy to read, or KJV 2000, which is really a new millennium Bible, or a, uh, what's another one, the AV7 they'll call it. These are rebranded Bibles based on the wrong Greek, so it's not the same. Now, we believe that the King James Bible is the perfect Word of God. This is a strong statement, and it has a tendency to ruffle the feathers of Bible professors. Well, that's not true. We, we know something different. We've got this other Greek, and we, we believe like the rest of the Protestants. Well, we're not a Protestant. The Protestants came out of the Catholic Church to protest the Catholic Church, to reform the Catholic Church. We're not Romans. The Roman Catholic Church started 300 years after some of the first disciples passed away. And they created a new church, and they hijacked Christianity. And even up until the 60s, most, most Catholics would be clear and say, well, I'm not a Christian, I'm a Catholic, or I'm not a born-again type, I'm a Catholic. And they made that delineation up until Vatican II. And again, uh, the devil's always trying to imitate what God is up to and deceive people. Uh, you're in Psalm 119, we're about to read that. In Proverbs 30, listen, he says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. There are many men historically that have added to the word, and they're found out as liars. And I don't know if we're going to get to that this morning. We may have to save that for next week. So my last statement there was, we believe that all other English translations of the Bible are corrupt and are perversions of the Word of God. I would ask you this, are you smarter than a college professor? Anyone dare raise their hand? <laughs> let, let me put it to you this way. Is there anybody here that's spiritually wiser than the smartest scientist on earth that doesn't believe in God? Yeah, we all are. The fool hath said in his heart that there is no God. If you're saved, you're smarter. Now, you're in Psalm 119, go to 97. Psalm 119, verse 97. And here's what we're called to do. He says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. You know what meditation means? Let me, let me give you the lower Georgia definition since it's only a, you know, a few miles of the borders that way, right? That means chewing on it mentally. <laughs> you're thinking about it. Uh, you're just kind of ruminating, right? You're taking something and you think about it throughout the day. Now this happens all, you know, something bad happens in your life and you're meditating on it all day and you just keep thinking on what bad happened and people can tell that you're down and depressed, right? Well, as a Christian, we get the Word of God in us and we fill up our spiritual cup and we take it with us and we chew on that verse for a little while and we reflect on those promises from God and we meditate on it to help us look more like Him and fulfill His desire for our life. So we need to meditate on His Word. That does not mean you sit on a Bible and go, um, no, no, different kind of meditation. The Eastern mysticism has hijacked meditation where they say, clear your mind and make it a blank slate. Well, that's not meditation in the Bible. Meditation is to think upon something, not to clear your mind. To get something, get a truth, some nugget, and just kind of hold on to it and think about it and think about it again and quote it to yourself. And all of a sudden, you may have an epiphany. You're like, I never saw this verse like that, but now I have an application today as I've been meditating on His Word. Ooh, I love God's law, and it's something we ought to meditate all throughout the day. Look at the next verse. He says in verse 98, Thou, through Thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. When you get God's Word in your heart and it's always with you, the enemy comes at you, you just have to stop and say, wait a minute, God, you've made me wiser than my enemy. Help me to not be afraid of my enemy. Help me to reflect on your Word. It makes me smart. Verse 99, Psalm 119, 99, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I have more understanding than everybody that taught me something. Why? Because a man can only take me so far. When you get alone with God and His Word, He'll take you places no one else can. He'll reveal things to you, secrets of spiritual wisdom. 
Verse 100, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. The more you obey what you see and the more you try to please the Lord by doing it, then He'll give you more wisdom and you'll be smarter than the old guys is what that means. The ancients. He says, God made me smarter than them. Now let me give you this thought. Rewind. Take a step back to verse 89 in this chapter. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord... Thy word is settled in heaven. Do we need a new version tomorrow? No. Forever, it's settled in heaven. The King James Bible did not take God by surprise, neither did the English language that has not always existed. He knows the beginning from the end, and he knows how to preserve his word in certain languages over time for his glory. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll end there. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Chapter number 15. My final thought is this. We should be King James only, but not King James ugly. So what do you mean by that? I've met some King James ugly folks, and I've been overzealous for the Lord before, and maybe a little rude to people. God wants us to shine a light of truth and love. And we shouldn't be ugly about it and misrepresent the Lord. Could you imagine the Lord, someone, God loves you! You'd say, man, can't you say that a little nicer because you're not really representing God, you know? Certain Bible camps do get a little ugly in how they present themselves. Be King James only, not King James ugly. We need to fight for our Bible, not fight with people over the Bible. Get them to believe the gospel first. Let's, let's get that passed. Let's get, help them to understand that God's preserved His Word. He's made a promise. Salvation is by faith alone. It says we're saved through faith in Ephesians chapter 2. It's your choice. Let's get past that first. If you find yourself arguing with somebody about a certain verse or a certain doctrine, and they're not even saved, you're wasting your time and you're not representing the Lord well. Christianity really does have a pride problem, and it happened to Judaism as well. If you remember, Judaism was hijacked by what was the strictest sect, is what the Bible used. Who, who, who was that? Pharisees. The Pharisees. They kept the law. They knew the law, and yet they didn't believe. They were trusting in their works to be saved. Uh, today, it's called rabbinical Judaism. That's who the Pharisees were. That's what's, who is identified. And they trust in their works, not in Christ. They're not saved. That's a big deal. But not only that, they were hypocrites. And behind scenes, they had idols, and they had all these problems behind the scenes. And I'm afraid that certain uh, independent, fundamental, King James-only Baptist churches have become just like the Pharisees. We know the law so good that we turn our nose at anybody else that doesn't look like us and sound like us and smell like us. Did you smell them? They smelled like a cigarette. <gasps> Kick them out of the church. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's being King James ugly. And Isaiah 65 is where we get that phrase, holier than thou. Who's heard that phrase? Yeah. Holier than thou. God is talking to the Pharisees of that time, and they said to somebody else, Stand thou over there. Don't come near us. For we are holier than thou. And God said, You're like a smoke in my nose. When Christianity gets so puffed up, I've got the truth and nobody else is as good as me. That's King James ugly. You know, Jesus ministered to some really broken people, didn't He? He was patient and long-suffering. He wasn't quick to just kick them out and, you know, you're not like me and I can't believe they said that. What a foolish thing. Why don't you get out of here? You need to be like me. That's ugly. That's pride. That's pride. And that's human nature. We're Christians, we're saved by trusting in Christ, and we're human beings, which means we're in the flesh and we're full of our own selves and pride, and we just love to look down on people and poke them down. And that's not right. We have to be careful of that. We should esteem others better than ourselves.
We should condescend to men of low estate. We should go down to, the, hey, how are you doing, brother? Let me help you up. Too many times we just want to shake our finger and stick our nose in the air and say, well, did you see that person, how terrible they are? That's bad Christianity. It's not right. Jesus would never do such a thing. We minister to those that want to get close to him. We help them. We teach them. We should fight for our Bible, but not fight with others over the Bible to cause confusion. That's not good. It's not healthy. We shouldn't despise people. Oh, they're filthy sinners. Did you hear what they said? It was scripturally incorrect. Yeah, we all say things that are incorrect. You know, we've all been babes in Christ. You know, we've all needed discipled at some point in our life. You're in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 33. First Corinthians 15, verse 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. You know, there are some people that don't get preached to because we're on our high horse. And there are Christians that are saved that never get ministered to and served and discipled because we're full of ourself, we're holier than thou. And God says, you stink. You think you're better than them. We're all wretched sinners. I want you to understand that all the other Bible translations, they have worldly popularity. You want to be popular in this world? Hey, just quote one of these funny Bibles. You want to get popular and preach in any church? Any version will do except the King James. That's the one that they would say, oh, oh, don't bring that one into here. That, the kids don't understand it. We don't understand it. You tell me the scholars can't understand the King James? Kind of interesting that that's the one that they attack the most. Why? Because they reject the doctrine of inspiration and preservation. That's why they hate the King James. And you say, well, where is God's Word then? Where is God's Word? Does anybody have it? Let me see it. Amen. It's in your hand. He preserved it. He fulfilled His promise. Now the liberal would say, oh, well, that's not it. Why? Because it's constantly changing. Didn't you know a new Bible came out last year? And maybe that one's better. Where is God's Word? Well, it's in my hand. It's in my heart. And here's the problem. They, they won't take a stand and say, this one is correct. If you believe that your Bible is correct, I applaud you. And I say, what great confidence you have in the Lord and His promises. But if you're a biblical scholar and you teach at one of these liberal arts Christian schools, well, which one's the best? Well, any of them will do. Really? They're all different. When I can pick one verse and literally I could read a dozen different versions and they're completely different, the application is different, the meaning is different, the words are different, you can't tell me any will do. I need a truck. No, no, no. I need an F-450 work truck. <laughs> There's a big difference. There's a big difference. I encourage you guys, make sure we don't get puffed up because we have the Word. Make sure that we love others with the Word and we teach them by example. I'll never forget, there was, we had a Bible study one day. I was invited to somebody's house and he had Bible studies regularly. And um, as I've often told you guys, I, I mentioned it more than once, but for instance, I just opened my Bible. I go to Mark chapter 10. That's where it opened up at. On verse 21, take up the cross is deleted. I know that because I've highlighted it. I've underlined it with a green highlighter. Uh, in verse 24 of Mark 10, it says, uh, how hard it is for them that trust in riches. That also is deleted from all the other Bibles. I took that handout I gave last week, and I do this in my new Bibles so that at a page flip, I can show you what's different. I'm in Luke chapter 3, verse 43, where it says Joseph and his mother. That's deleted. Why? Because the other Bibles say that Joseph was Jesus' father. Well, that's a doctrinal change. I can go from page to page to page. And that's exactly what I did that night with this same Bible. It had a different cover back then. Uh, but this gentleman, he had one eyeball. And he would take out his eye and show it off to the kids. And he'd put it in his mouth and play around. He did some funny stuff. But he was at this Bible study. And he's playing with his eye and stuff. And, and he had an NIV. And I'm showing him. And I'm showing. And he's like, well, no, they're all the same. And I'm like, well, let me show you this. Okay, now go here. Well, I mean, that's no big deal. I mean, that could be the same. And I, after verse, after verse, finally, he takes his NIV. And he throws it on the floor like a football. And he's like, all right, I get it. 
my Bible's terrible. He used worse words than that. And I'm like, well, let me give you one for free. And I didn't do it to provoke him to anger, but I just when you see it, and you see it, and you see it, you finally say, you know what? Things that are different cannot be the same. And when it changes doctrine, that's a big deal. And I do believe God breathed His words for us. And then He said, and now I'm going to seal it and protect it. It's my gift to you. Wouldn't it be terrible if your wife, your spouse, maybe those of you that have a spouse that has passed, let's say you find a letter, you open it up, and it's a four-page love letter, and it, you're missing pages two and three. Well, that'd be terrible. Get the real deal. Get the one true love letter that's not missing anything. God's perfect word, the King James Bible. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Lord, I pray that this morning You would give us a spirit of unity, Lord. I pray that You would fill us with Your Holy Spirit. Give us a desire to get closer to You. Lord, give us a great confidence in what You've given us. And Lord, help us to be able to expose the works of darkness with Your true light. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.